These are the Maxwell's equations as they first appeared in 1861, a set of 12 equations for electrodynamics. It will probably take you a while to recognize that these 12 equations are mathematically equivalent to the electric and magnetic Gauss's law, the Ampere-Maxwell law, the Faraday's law, and the charge current continuity equations. It took more than 20 years before Oliver Heaviside rewrote the fundamental equations of Maxwell's treatise on electricity and magnetism into a new and more compact form with his invention of vector calculus. These are the four Maxwell equations, published by Oliver Heaviside in 1884, which by the late 1890s has become the standard Maxwell equations for electrodynamics. We have the two Gauss's laws, which state that the divergence of the electric field is related to its charge density, while the magnetic field is always divergentless. We have the Faraday's law, which describes how a changing magnetic field can induce a circulating electric field around a closed loop. Lastly, the Ampere-Maxwell law states that the total magnetic field circulation around a closed loop is proportional to the sum of the conduction current and the displacement current. Heaviside's version of the Maxwell equation helps express the electromagnetic fields in a more understandable form through the divergences and curls of the electric and magnetic fields. These vector operators are intuitive because it provides a way to visualize the character of the vector field. The divergence and curl tells us how much the vector field is diverging and rotating. It turns out that writing the vector field in terms of its divergence and curl also has a solid mathematical foundation, and we owe it to Hermann von Helmholtz for this insight. The fundamental theorem of vector calculus, also known as the Helmholtz decomposition theorem, states that a continuous vector field, F, can always be decomposed into its constituent parts, here and denoted as Fg and Fc. Fg is the field that is irrotational and has zero curl which can be constructed from the gradient of a scalar field. Thus, we call Fg a gradient field. Fc is the field that is rotational or solenoidal and thus has zero divergence. It can be constructed from the curl of a vector field. Thus, we call Fc a curl field. The derivation of the Helmholtz decomposition is easy, and we shall explain it in this video. For more about the properties of gradient and curl fields, please check out these videos on the same electromagnetism playlist. We can obtain the time-independent Maxwell equations by simply setting the time derivatives to zero. Now we can clearly see that the electric field has zero curl, while the magnetic field has zero divergence in the static limit. The source of the electric field divergence is due to the charge density while the source of the magnetic field curl is due to the current density. Thus, we call the charge and current densities the source terms. The electric field which has zero curl can be expressed as the gradient field of a scalar field, herein denoted as the electric potential V. The magnetic field which has zero divergence can be expressed as the curl field of a vector field, herein denoted as the magnetic vector potential A, in this video, we shall derive the form of the electric and magnetic fields in terms of their source terms, namely the Coulombs and Biot Savart's law. Analogous expressions will also be derived for the electric and magnetic vector potentials. We shall also introduce the Laplacian and vector Laplacian, which allows a unified framework for thinking about the electric and magnetic fields in terms of their source terms. This formulation thus allows for a unified way of thinking about the electric and magnetic fields in terms of the constituents divergent solenoidal and Laplacian fields. Let's begin. Part 1. The Laplacian and its Green's Function Consider a linear differential operator L. For example, the Laplacian is a prime example of interest for our video. The Green's function, when acted by the differential operator L, would yield the Dirac delta function. For the 3D Laplacian operator, the Green's function is well known and is given as shown within the green bracket. 
Let's do a quick check. Without loss of generality, we can set the R prime to be zero. The Laplacian operator in spherical coordinates is given in the blue box. It can then be shown that the Laplacian of one over R is zero, except at R equals to zero where it diverts. Thus, this is consistent with the behavior of a Dirac delta function. What is left for us is to determine its value when integrated over all space. Let us rewrite the Laplacian in terms of the divergence of a gradient, of which the latter can be evaluated using the vector calculus identity and spherical coordinates. Clearly, it still diverges at r equals to zero. Using the Gauss's theorem, we can rewrite the volume integral of the divergences as a surface integral as shown. Taking the integration volume to be that of a sphere of radius r, we arrived at a finite contribution of minus 4 pi. Thus, to sum it up, the Laplacian of 1 over r is 0 everywhere except at r equals to 0 and has an integrated volume contribution of minus 4 pi. The Green's function of the Laplacian, per definition, is then given by the expression highlighted in green. This is a very useful identity, which we shall exploit in the next chapter. Part 2. Helmholtz decomposition into zero curl and divergence fields. Let's start with a general vector field, f in the spatial coordinate r. The vector field f can be expanded into an integral through the delta Dirac function, where the integration is over the spatial coordinate r prime instead. For the discussion in this video, we will let the integration volume omega be all space. That will help keep the math simple. Now let's insert the identity for the Dirac delta function. We derived in the previous chapter expressed in terms of the Laplacian and its Green's function. Using a vector calculus identity, which is most famously known as the definition of vector Laplacian, we arrived at the result as follows. So we have basically rewritten a general vector field, f at coordinate r, as an integral of f over all space. At this point, it seems like we are just making things more complicated. However, the simplification comes in the conceptual understanding. First, we identify that the first integral can be written as the gradient of a scalar field v called potential. Next, the second integral can be written as the curl of a vector field A, called vector potential. So, we have basically shown that a general vector field can be expressed as a sum of a gradient field and a curl field. This is the major conceptual advancement. A gradient field has zero curl, and the curl field has zero divergence. Thus, we arrived at the key idea of the Helmholtz decomposition that a well-behaved vector field can be resolved into the sum of a curl-free vector field and a divergence-free vector field. Visually, the gradient field has a divergent character as illustrated. Intuitively, it is as if the field is emanating from some regions of sources and sinks. The curl field, on the other hand, has a solenoidal character. It is rotational in nature and appears to have a rotational motion around a central axis. Lastly, we can also have vector field that has zero curl and divergence. We call such field harmonic since they are the solutions to the Laplace equation. Boundary conditions play an important role in the solutions of these vector fields, and we shall defer to the accompanying video the discussion about these constituent vector fields. We summarize the key ideas in this chapter. We have shown that a general vector field can indeed be resolved into the sum of a curl-free vector field and a divergence-free vector field. The former is represented by a gradient field of potential V, while the latter a curl field of vector potential A. Here we also have a general expression for the potentials. I want to draw your attention to the divergence and curl operator in these expressions, which are in the coordinates r. In the next chapter, we will get them to operate in coordinate r prime instead, and the power of the framework will immediately become apparent. 
part three. This is how the key equations in electrostatics are obtained. As we will learn in this chapter, static electric fields are gradient fields, and that the positive and negative charges are sources and sinks for electric fields. Starting from where we left off in the last chapter on gradient fields, our next task is to rewrite the formula for the potential, such that the divergence is in R prime instead of R. This can be done with the help of some vector calculus identities as shown. I shall not bore you with the math, but feel free to pause the video here if you would like to inspect the math. In a nutshell, we indeed managed to get an expression for V, where the divergence is in R prime instead of R. However, it incur an additional surface integral term as shown. But if the field is well behaved, and if we take the integration volume over all space, the surface term should diminish. Great, let's assemble everything we have so far. To get the expression for the gradient field, we just need to take the gradient of the potential V. With the help of the identity as highlighted, we arrive at the final expression for the gradient field. Now, we are ready to make the connection to Maxwell equations. We have here the Faraday's and the electric Gauss's law. The former states that the electric field is a zero curl field. Thus, the electric field can be written as a gradient field. The Gauss law states that the divergence of the electric field is given by the charge density. Thus, we arrived at the well-known form of the electric potential and electric field in terms of the charge density. The latter is the well-known Coulomb's law. Written in this form, it is intuitively clear that the charge density is the source of electric fields. Using the definition of gradient field, the electric Gauss's law can be written as the Laplacian of the electric potential. This equation is the well-known Poisson equation. In summary, we have here the key equations in electrostatics. Part 4. This is how the key equations in magnetostatics are obtained. As we will learn in this chapter, static magnetic fields are curl fields, and that current flow is the source of these rotational motion. Starting from where we left off in Chapter 2 on curl fields, our next task is to rewrite the formula for the vector potential such that the curl is in R prime instead of R, just like what we did for the electric field case. This can be done with the help of some vector calculus identities as shown. We shall not bore you with the math, but feel free to pause the video here if you would like to inspect the math. In a nutshell, we indeed managed to get an expression for the vector potential where the curl is in R prime instead of R. However, it incur an additional surface integral term as shown. But if the field is well behaved, and if we take the integration volume over all space, the surface term should diminish. Great, let's assemble everything we have so far. To get the expression for the curl field, we just need to take the curl of the vector potential A. With the help of the identity as highlighted, we arrive at the final expression for the curl field. Now, we are ready to make the connection to Maxwell equations. We have here the magnetic Gauss's law and the Ampere's law. The former states that the magnetic field is a zero divergence field. Thus, the magnetic field can be written as a curl field. The Ampere's law states that the curl of the magnetic field is given by the current density. Thus, we arrived at the well-known form of the magnetic potential and magnetic field in terms of the current density. The latter is the well-known bias of Arts law. Written in this form, it is intuitively clear that the current density is the source of magnetic fields. Now, is there an analogous Poisson equation for magnetic field, just like the electric case? Indeed, we have the so-called vector Poisson equation for the vector potential defined in terms of the vector Laplacian.
We leave this as an exercise, but check out these videos in the electromagnetic playlist if you are interested to know more.